It's an honor to have been offered the opportunity to speak on behalf of the children for whom we work for and with here at Handicap International. My name is Nidhi Kapoor and I'm the Regional Coordinator for the Ubuntu Care Project in Kenya, Rwanda and Burundi, a project which looks at the three dynamic factors of vulnerability, age, gender and disability, in order to address the causes and conse consequences of sexual violence against boys and girls with and without disabilities. I say it is an honor because through this project we are working with some of the most vulnerable, marginalized and isolated children in our communities and I've been tasked with the important responsibility of bringing their voices and issues to the international stage. The Ubuntu Care Project today is the result of a process of research and reflection dating back to 2009. Handicap International's field teams observed that one of the causes of HIV AIDS and mental trauma was in fact sexual violence. Based on these observations and due to a lack of evidence and research on this issue in developing countries, Handicap International and Save the Children decided to carry out a joint study focused on the vulnerability to sexual violence of children with disabilities in four countries, Burundi, Madagascar, Mozambique and Tanzania. After one and a half years of field-based research, the findings revealed that despite widely different contexts, the factors that render children with disabilities particularly vulnerable to this type of violence are similar. Social, social exclusion, discrimination against disability, and barriers to accessing appropriate support services. As a result, child survivors with disabilities are more likely to bear the full brunt of the consequences of sexual violence, STDs, unwanted pregnancy, social marginalization, psychological trauma, as well as new impairments, while the large majority of perpetrators go unpunished. To learn more, I can signpost you to the 2010 advocacy report, Out from the Shadows. But for the purposes of our discussion today, suffice to say that children with disabilities are four times more likely to be affected by physical violence than children without disabilities. And children with disabilities are nearly three times more affected by sexual violence than children without disabilities. I would encourage my fellow practitioners to adopt a more nuanced understanding when connecting the dots between sexual violence and disability as it pertains to children. It is so often unfortunately the case that children with disabilities are grouped together in one homogenous category of vulnerability, when in fact there is a huge variation in the type, nature and extent of disability amongst individuals. Our research has found, for example, that children with intellectual impairment and children with sensory impairment are the most affected by sexual violence. This is important for us to know when it comes to program design and ensuring we are truly reducing the vulnerability. We are truly reaching the most vulnerable and at-risk children. Reconsider too our conventional thinking on the causal relationship between disability and sexual violence. We often assume that disability is an additional factor of vulnerability when rendering, which renders children more likely to be targeted for sexual violence. But let's go beyond this one-way relationship and consider that an incidence of sexual violence can also be a precursor to disability. Survivors of sexual abuse, assault or rape can suffer from a manifold of consequences such as HIV, AIDS, fistula and PTSD, all of which are understood under the umbrella term disability. In fact, the International Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities offers a fairly large framework vis-a-vis -vis the definition of disability. Like Handicap International, we can consider debilitating disease, physical impairments and mental trauma, the three examples I just offered, as all part of our wider understanding of disability. So it is a, it may be an important opportunity for us to unpack our assumptions about the causal relationship between sexual violence and disability. I would like to say, share some other challenges, considerations and suggestions for possible ways forward. While of course one child survivor is already one too many, when it comes, when it comes to garnering donor interests and funds, the absolute numbers do matter. And the truth is that compared to interventions in other sectors, like health, shelter, WASH, for example, child protection will almost always suffer from a lack of hard numbers. For the Ubuntu project, the absolute numbers of children are very small on the response side. If we look in terms of child survivors, 
even smaller when we look to also cross-reference child survivors with disability. Vast underreporting and the invisibility of isolated children with disabilities are huge hurdles here. Prevention numbers are even more difficult to grapple with, as colleagues in the wider child protection sector are well aware. It is always tricky to try to prove how many incidents of sexual violence were in fact prevented, so that we can only offer proxy indicators of the success. This can have an impact on our ability to procure funding for future interventions. I think one of the ways forward is for us to get better at measuring outcomes and impact on the well-being of children, rather than simply measuring the number of children targeted. This is perhaps something we need to onboard across the whole protection sector. The technical complexity of our project is also high, and it can be a challenge to source personnel on the ground and even at management levels who are equally competent in the three themes of child protection, gender, and disability. Most will have two out of three, but it's rare to find someone who has all three. So we have to make sure that capacity is sufficient, and therefore there's a lot of emphasis and resources going into training, mentoring, and ongoing, ongoing technical supervision. This is also part of making sure our own house is in order. Are we sure we are respecting the basic principles like do no harm? Child safeguarding measures, for example, are a serious consideration particularly when we're talking about some of the most vulnerable children in our communities, child survivors, isolated children with disabilities. You know, we're talking about some of the most vulnerable children. We need to make sure that we're doing our jobs correctly. And this is why I always encourage my teams to think beyond do no harm. In my view, the humanitarian development sectors could benefit from taking a page out of the book of peacebuilding actors. Their focus on what they call conflict sensitivity is a sort of do no harm version 2.0. It enables us to think through the unintended negative consequences our interventions may have, but also goes further to analyze how to maximize the positive impacts or benefits of our interventions. So reducing harm while underlining the need to multiply the knock-on benefits in the planning and implementation of our activities. As a tangible example, we can look more closely at the need to integrate child protection across other sectors. For example, health centers in Rwanda receive huge numbers of teen mothers every year. Today there are 57,000 in Rwanda for prenatal consultations, yet almost none of these cases are registered or treated as cases of sexual violence or abuse because there is a lack of understanding around consent of minor girls many of whom are considered socioculturally to have achieved adulthood once they become mothers, whatever their age. There is an entry point here for us to bring together health and judicial actors to improve our programming for these girls. And a sort of appeal to fellow humanitarian and development workers, look around and if you don't see at least 10% of children with varying forms of disability in your schools, child-friendly spaces and other interventions, then I would venture to say you're probably doing something wrong. Critically examine and ask yourself if you are truly reaching the most vulnerable children. Rethinking quality programming and transforming your activities from ex exclusive to inclusive. A starting point can, to be, can be to approach and partner with national, local, national and local disability associations. To give a concrete example, in case management, local actors working with children and adults with disabilities can be an entry point for identification and referral of cases. Recognizing that it is here that you will find actually the most vulnerable children, three to four times more likely to have experienced abuse. Also significantly less likely to access adequate or adapted services and care. It allows us to go straight to the heart of the issue. Yet this approach has often been ignored by child protection agencies that might in public discourse give homage to the importance of inclusive programming, but the on-the-ground reality is that they typically consider children with disabilities as an afterthought, almost as a tick-boxing exercise. Can I perhaps challenge you to incorporate a genuinely inclusive approach as the foundation of your next project design and funding proposal? To conclude, I will just say that I hope some of these considerations will give you pause, offer some food for thought, or initiate the search for new solutions. And I hope the children with whom I work will agree that I represented them as well as I could, and that I did them justice. Thank you very much. <laughs>